Welcome to Radical Responsibility, the podcast dedicated to ridding the world of blame and shame, where we explore the issues you care about from a unique perspective. 100% ownership for each and every circumstance we face in life, day in and day out. Hi, welcome to the Radical Responsibility Podcast. This is Fleet Mall, your host, and today I'm having a conversation with spiritual teacher and meditation teacher, Craig Hamilton, who created the Academy of Evolutionaries and is well known for his approach to direct awakening. So we had a deep conversation about evolutionary psychology, about meditation, about direct awakening, and really how to accelerate our path to liberating ourselves from the the kind of human conditioning that can perpetuate suffering for all of us. So give it a listen. Craig Hamilton's an amazing teacher. I really enjoyed the conversation. Welcome, Craig. Thank you, Fleet. It's great to be here. Uh, we're exploring my favorite topic, so yeah, I'm it's great to diving in. It's really great to have you. Thank you for making the time, and and great to connect with you. We kind of realized as we talked previously that we had connected before years ago. So I'm going to uh, share a bit of your background for audience, and then we'll jump right into the conversation. Sound good? Okay, sounds good. All right. So Craig Hamilton is a pioneer in the emerging field of evolutionary spirituality and a leading voice in the movement for conscious evolution. As the guiding force behind integral enlightenment, Craig offers spiritual guidance and teachings to an international community spanning 85 countries. Craig created the Academy for Evolutionaries, which offers practical spiritual tools and training informed by an up-to-date understanding of the human condition based on his on-the-ground research at the leading edge of spiritual practice and inquiry. His courses have more than 16,000 graduates to date. He's considered to be a teacher of teachers and counts several of today's leading spiritual luminaries among his students. Craig is a founding member of Ken Wilber's Integral Institute, a member of Deepak Chopra's Evolutionary Leaders Forum, and was a participant in the Synthesis Dialogues and Interdisciplinary Think Tank presided over by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Okay. Thanks, Fleet. I think people can uh, get the sense of why we're having a conversation with you today about spirituality and consciousness. So, you know, I'm not going to ask you to, uh, I want to start a little bit with your background, but I don't want to try to have you kind of encapsulate what I'm sure is a a really rich life story into into a a minute or two. So maybe instead we could focus on, um, maybe was there a pivotal moment that kind of set you on the trajectory? that you ended up being a teacher of meditation and a kind of explorer of evolutionary consciousness and spirituality. Um, so if there was such a moment and then uh, how you kind of ended up in, um, you know, this particular is this pretty broad spectrum of meditation and the whole secular mindfulness movement and spirituality in general, what kind of directed you into this evolutionary approach? Mm. So, two-part question there okay i'll I'll do my best (laughs) all right well i can't i don't know that i can say there was one one precise moment i mean i could probably point to a dozen precise moments that were the moment that catalyzed the next thing and the next thing but Mm -hmm. but what i can say to your first question is that you know well well, let me let me me step back give you it in a in a nutshell so I, i didn't start out as a spiritual person my family wasn't spiritually oriented, but I started to have a spiritual longing in my teens that grew and grew and intensified and quickly got me doing a lot of uh, Eastern practices and exploring Western mysticism and just really kind of starting to feel that my life was going to be a mystical life, that I was going to be pursuing enlightenment for for my for my life path in one way or another and it took different forms at different times you know like i said i i dove deep into the eastern approach initially that was a little more resonant you know doing trying to become a christian when you're kind of raised an atheist that's a tough (laughs) tough sell i tried to go to church with some of my friends but it just the the narrative never made sense so like many of us i turned east and um I think the moment I would point to was is just that I was I was diving into all these Eastern practices, like many of us, doing different meditation practices, learning from Buddhism, learning from Hinduism, Vedanta, a lot of these different approaches. And there seemed to be a kind of 
kind of global meta narrative in those traditions that said that spiritual it said something that was kind of paradoxical to me and somewhat seemed seemed like a contradiction or it seemed like an oxymoron and it was that that on the one hand spiritual awakening our true nature our enlightened essence is right here right now it's closer than close when you awaken what you realize is that this is the moment this th- this moment right now is is it and there's never been a better, more perfect moment to be awakened than right now. And I'm only awakening to who I already am. I'm not awakening to something I, I wasn't before. You know, we're all, it's all the, the, the story uh, in Eastern wisdom is that there's an enlightened self and that it's who and what we already are. And that if we just remove the veils that are obscuring it, we will know ourselves to be none other than the source of all the good, the true, and the beautiful, and all glorious things, and the expression of the creative force of the cosmos, and all of it is who and what we are. So, there's this profound affirmation of our essence, and of our, of really what it is to be a human being, and the glory of what it is to be a human being, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, throughout those traditions, and of course, there are, you know, are exceptions here and there, but broadly speaking, there's this assertion that, okay, that might be true, but enlightenment, realizing that, takes lifetimes, <laughs> or at least, you know, a, a lot of work in this lifetime. It's going to take you this whole lifetime and maybe a thousand more you know that it's this and you know and it's gonna it's gonna take you forever and 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 very few will ever discover it and so there was something to me always about that kind of the tension between those two that on the one hand it's right here and on the other hand it's a million miles away and so i think that kind of paradox really drove me into the kind of approach I ultimately ended up in, which is a very, let's call it experimental approach, a very modernist approach. Let's say it's a kind of scientific approach to spiritual awakening. Because because I, and just to add to that, I mean, I'm, I'm sharing my sort of inquiry, but along with my inquiry was my own spiritual practice and my own spiritual awakening. I started having profound spiritual experiences at a pretty young age, just spontaneously, just perhaps catalyzed by the practices I was dabbling in, but sometimes just out of the blue, riding my bike along a river and suddenly just flooded with this feeling of grace and that, that the cosmos was already perfect and that the moment was already perfect and that I was already whole and nothing was missing. And just, you know, being brought to tears by these kind of revelatory moments that would just happen to me. And so, I was having this experience of awakening and, and that, that affirmed everything I was reading in the, in the Eastern books, right? It was, it was, yes, right, it's right here, it's right now, oh, I, 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 I get what they're talking about and I'm experiencing it. And then, but, you know, go back and do your practice for a hundred lifetimes and maybe, maybe you'll really get it. And so, so all of that drove me into this kind of uh, laboratory approach or this experimental approach, working with other Westerners, let's say, you know, other Americans and Europeans who were interested in these things, but also found that the traditional approaches seemed maybe, you know, mired in ancient myths or dogmas or superstitions or just didn't have that the appetite to go and and swap you know as 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 your te- one of your teachers roshi glassman used to say you have to swallow the whole fish you know if you're going to give yourself to a tradition you have to take it bones and all you can't just pick and choose the the little practices you want to take out of it and make that your path so i think people who felt that they couldn't swallow the whole fish you know joined with me and and I I joined with them and I was involved in a number of different kind of experimental environments where we were really trying to push the edge and say, well, what is spiritual awakening? How do we do it? What is it devoid of traditional stories and narratives and myths and dogmas? What is it in psychological terms for us human beings right now? And is it really you know, does it have to remain mystified and does it have to remain far away? Or is it, is it, is, is the truth that it's here right now really the, the more important truth? And is there a way we can practice that can reveal it to us right now?
And so that maybe set the stage for really how I ended up teaching these things and, you know, down this path. Well, that can set the stage for a fascinating conversation because that tension between the kind of gradual and sudden enlightenment approaches and linear versus nonlinear nature of awakenings and all that is a longstanding conversation. And, yeah, that's um, right. um, but so maybe you could, could you describe a little bit what you mean by, you know, you're working with others and in, in kind of these, uh, you know, evolutionary laboratories of sorts, you know, so pushing the edge. So what was pushing the edge about? Was it intensive practice, uh, experiences of fasting or solitude or, or what was pushing the edge? And then, uh, and was it solitary? Was it dialogic? Was it community based? And then, and then how did it begin to take on this, this quality of uh, what you describe as kind of evolutionary consciousness or evolutionary spirituality? Yeah. So, like I said, I, I participated in a number of different um, environments. They were collective in nature. I mean, I'll, I'll just say my work has always had a kind of collective focus to it, both mm -hmm. in my own like seeking what I, what I was attracted to, and and ultimately what I ended up have ended up leading and guiding. There's, it's my, you know, the, again speaking back to the to the traditions. Versus what would a more experimental approach be? You know, I, I, I noticed, you know, I, I, as I think, you know, I was editor of a magazine called What is Enlightenment that for, for about a decade. And this magazine was kind of trying to explore this very question, this like, well, what is enlightenment now in our age and time? And how, what, what can we learn from the traditions? But what can we learn from a scientific approach to all this? And, you know, doing a lot of comparative study and analysis of these things. And, um, you know, one thing I noticed in a lot of my encounters with traditions, and I know you can't, you can never say the traditions all believe this because there's probably a tradition that believes in any version of anything that any of us come up with now it was someone thought of it before too. So it's not like the old and the new is a kind of a false, false dichotomy. But I, I've noticed a tendency in the traditions often to, um, to sort of, even if people practice together, meaning like we might meditate together, but we kind of keep our, our practice to ourselves. And I found this when I talked to uh, Christian monastics, that the, the only person they're supposed to talk with their, uh, talk about their practice with was their elder. And I, I've talked to and again, I'm sure this is evolving in the Buddhist community now, but you talk to traditional Buddhists and you might be having the most incredible experiences on that meditation cushion, but you're not going to talk to them about, about them with your fellow, uh, with the people in your Sangha. You might talk about them with your sensei or your Roshi and, and get, you know, direction. But there's always been this kind of idea. We have to kind of keep our, our spiritual experience, our spiritual uh, development kind of private or pretty private. And, Something I, I, one of the things I found in my own experience was that being in a collective context with other people and actually really actively sharing all those things and saying, well, what's really happening for you in your practice? And this is what's happening for me and, and comparing notes and well, what happens when you do this? And here's a response to mm -hmm. that. And, you know, when the grasping begins, what if you didn't resist the grasping and you, you, you didn't make a problem out of the grasping and did, would you notice that? It, it wasn't actually in the way. And anyway, but being in a very dialogical process right in the heart of our spiritual practice, ultimately even doing spiritual practice out loud in the sense that we would come together in groups and practice meditating out loud, talk, talking, uh, describing the meditation process while we were in it and kind of helping each other while we were in it and all and not just meditation but also other aspects of our spiritual development you know how do we take on uh the the wily ego and it's ever shape-shifting forms and really giving each other very honest reflection about that and lifting each other up when we're struggling and challenging each other when we're indulging and you know really having a tight crucible of kind of awakened conversation going those are the kinds of environments I'm talking about that why I said pushing the edge, because there's something edgy about it. When, when I say to you, Hey fleet, I want, I want to give my whole life to the path of awakening and I don't want to hold anything back. And I want 
And, and you say to me, you want to do the same. And we say, well, I say, okay, well, I'm going to challenge you anytime I feel you're not giving your whole life to that. And you're going to challenge me anytime I'm not. And we're going to really create a kind of structure of mutual accountability for our highest aspirations and then live into that every moment of our lives and really practice into that and then share what's happening in our practices and and challenge each other on that you know not without guidance you know of course hierarchies emerge people with more experience less experience or you know the wiser are helping the less accomplished you know all of these things happen it's not like just a um kind of a free for all without structure but but the spirit of it i guess i'm trying to convey there so that's kind of the what i mean by the laboratory environment and then in, in the kind of edge pushing environment that i've i've been involved in and tried to catalyze and then to your second question about how did this how did how did the focus on spirituality as an evolutionary process come to be because you mentioned i think the term conscious mm -hmm. evolution and the term evolutionary spirituality and these are so so this is a whole emergent way of approaching spiritual awakening and way and also way of understanding um the human spiritual thrust you know that our our higher spiritual potential um again we could say that broadly speaking in what we might just call the pre-modern traditional times um there was not you know nobody really thought things were progressing towards something better just and i, I don't mean this in a just spiritual i just mean how humanity looked at what what it was mm -hmm. to be alive and what the universe was the belief in in almost all traditions was that we things started really good and degenerated from there <laughs> whether they started in the garden of eden or you know we started in the golden age in, in in hinduism and deteriorated through many ages down to the iron age where things are very not very good you know the, in other words a, a lot of traditional kind of the, the mythic structures were that were kind of things are getting work getting bad but there's still a possibility for individual salvation but you know then all of you know the the world started to to turn on its head around the you know the time of the enlightenment the western enlightenment um and we started you know people started to you know the the german idealist philosophers all came out with their visions that were very evolutionary and they said no it's not deteriorating we're actually evolving toward god we're evolving toward a higher possibility our human potential is rising it's not it's not degrading and and then, you know, Darwin got cottoned onto the idea of evolution. We had biological evolution as an idea come out. And now evolution has sort of become the grand, at least one of the grand narratives of the human race at this point is that, hey, you know, let's evolve. I'm evolving. Are you evolving? Culture is evolving. Conscience evolving. Technology is evolving. And, you know, of course, at the same time, some things are devolving <laughs> in parallel with that that we're all familiar with and, and trying to counter. We could, you know, think of those as market corrections and the cosmic upward trajectory, maybe, I hope. Um, but anyway, so I, I feel like uh, this whole evolutionary framework for spirituality has, really is something I, I got into, was very influenced by... Um, Teilhard de Chardin, Sri Aurobindo in the East, uh, in the West, Andrew Cohen, who was a big pioneer of that, was, was someone I studied with and got very on fire with evolution. Ken Wilbur has been a big proponent of, of this and many, many others, Brian Swim, Thomas Berry, you know, lot, there's a whole lineage now of kind of the evolutionary spiritual um, elders out there who, who I think inspired a lot of us with this vision. But for me, what it came down to was just, it gave, it, it, it helped me put my own spiritual longing and my own spiritual awakenings that were happening in, in what to me felt like the, the highest, most meaningful context, which is that this isn't just about me and my liberation from suffering or my realization of my fullest potential to have a an amazing inspired life this is about our evolution as a species and it's ultimately about the continued evolution of the cosmos itself i would even say 
maybe we could say God's even evolving and, and that the highest, you know, spirit is evolving, that, that what this is, is moving forward. And we, through our participation in things like meditation and other spiritual practices, like I was describing, we're participating in that forward movement. We, that's what it means. It doesn't just mean you can have a good life and get this. It means you're participating in this movement that transcends you and that will be, has been going on for at least 13.7 billion years and will continue going on for, you know, perhaps forever in some form. So, you know, we're, mm. our lives can take, can become very meaningful. And, and, and I think that's important because a lot of people, if you, I don't know what you've noticed about this this particular moment in history, and I really mean this moment, like this last few years, let's say, you know, I, the more people I talk to, more I, I, I've heard a lot of kind of despair or kind of like hopelessness or kind of, well, what can I really do that's going to mean anything anyway? And so many things seem to be going backward and we're really destroying our planet and we're really, humanity doesn't seem to care. And, you know, so many things that we can feel are degenerating or stuck and it can feel kind of like, well, okay, I can do my spiritual practice and, and, and learn how to be more calm or more mindful or more whatever I, I aspire to be. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, so what? Maybe I'm happier, but it's, it's not so what when we start to realize that we are evolution and motion and that everything we do is either adding momentum to evolution or it's adding momentum to the inertia. And so, so let me make my life part of the evolutionary thrust is, as whole, fully as I can. Mm. Yeah, this conversation about, um, you know, are we in an evolutionary trends or devolutionary trends? And uh, many spiritual traditions talk about, you know, that devolution into a dark age. Um, yeah, I always appreciated Gurdjieff's view um, that um, it's kind of spiral. So you have times of great awakening. It spreads into the culture. You have a kind of golden age. Eventually, things kind of disperse, become too diminished and starts to deteriorate into a devolutionary spiral into kind of a, a dark rage. But that but what was attained, there is an evolution mm. of like awakened energy, if you want to call it that, or consciousness. And uh, so that hasn't diminished, but mm. now it's it's in the hands of a few and mm. they're actually able to concentrate it and expand it further. And when they do then they, at some point, they can no longer hold on to it. It has to go back into the culture. It disperses and withdraws again and then gets concentrated, increased again. So it's these, these spirals kind of going up and up. So it is a long-term evolutionary uh, view of consciousness and reality that includes the possibilities of, of uh, you know, Falling backward of, of, and of, contracting. Yeah. Yeah, expansion yeah. And, and contraction uh, sure yeah, and, and that whole view of you know are we in an entropic universe or not you know these are really uh big questions and i think you know yeah. for myself i've always been an optimist so i never you know was much about the dark age things even though it's talked about in some of my own spiritual traditions and so forth and this being the kali yuga age and all that uh but the last couple of years have <laughs> <laughs> maybe reconsider <laughs> I know. Taken my optimism just a little bit um yeah. not completely but it, it has given me pause I, um, I get it uh, so you know i i'd like to you know this idea of direct awakening uh non-dual approach uh you know that and, and some teachers go so far as to say the only thing obscuring us from realizing our our true nature or, or being awake is the thought that we're not awake to begin with. Mm -hmm. And some will just lead people to these kind of cognitive dialogues, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. can give you a moment. Um, uh, I'm not sure what they do ultimately. But, um, and then there's that, there's the hard work, long-term, you know, um, approach and that uh, maybe the nonlinear uh, event of, of an awakening is a nonlinear event, but it's not likely to happen unless there's the you know, the work, the gradual work. So that that kind of whole milieu that you referenced mm -hmm. to begin with. And I'm just wondering, you know, another proponent of evolutionary spirituality, obviously Ken Wilber, our mutual colleague and friend, Ken Wilber. And he has this model that uh, he talks about a lot of, um, of uh, I believe, I, if I have the order correct, I think it's waking up, growing up, cleaning up and showing up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there is the the growing up and the 
cleaning up. The cleaning up references doing the shadow work and and the growing up, you know, is just the process of human maturation, becoming more emotionally intelligent and so forth. And of course, there are, you know, many, many people uh, who've had profound awakening experiences, uh, but then manifested in ways that it was fairly clear that their work was not completed, right? Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, nicely, to put it nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I think we've all experienced that to a degree. I mean, sure. we've maybe had very profound experiences is related to meditation for some people psychedelics or for some people it's just a spontaneous moment in nature but how much did it fundamentally change how i was showing up in the world or able to show up in the world and you know sometimes we talk about you know in in the buddhism they sometimes talk about the only difference and i think it's spoken in other traditions as well the only difference between the buddha or an awakened being is that they realize their Buddha nature and have confidence in it, whereas the rest of us who are also essentially have Buddha nature and are essentially awakened beings, we lack confidence in that. And therefore, I guess we fall into, you know, kind of all the neurotic uh, kind of human coping, fear-based kind of survival-based coping psychological strategies for living our lives because we don't have that confidence. So, So, you know, what is it that earns that confidence? So, I, I just kind of trying to set the stage here for talk, talking more a little more about this in terms of this day. You know, the focus of our summit, the best year of your life, is really to try to provide um, ourselves and our audience and uh, with uh, the inspiration, the clarity on on how to move forward in our lives. Some of the science we we have a whole day focused on the science of habit change. We have a day on mindset and performance. The very first day is just about clarifying who we are and what we want, clarifying our vision and life purpose. And so, you know, this day on spirituality and consciousness, um, you know, maybe if we could talk about it from, you know, a little bit of a path quality without turning it into a thousand lifetimes, right? But, you know, people who would like to, uh, you know, maybe they are uh, uh, involved in a spiritual path of some kind and, and they feel like it's plateaued or they're not realizing the experiences they've read about in the books or maybe that hasn't been a big focus of their life and they would like to deepen the spiritual aspect of their life and get started with something like that. So I'm wondering if you could, you know, talk about that, uh, maybe from, from, from a bit of a path quality at the, at the expense of not, you know, and not turning it into just a, a linear thing that would be an obstacle to the possibilities of awakening. Wow. Well, you said a lot there, a lot of interesting places to jump in. Um, so somewhere I want to jump in, and I think it will hopefully have a path quality to it that you're looking for, is you were, uh, well, you were speaking a little bit about, okay, we, you know, this, this, you know, the paradox that I raised at the beginning, I guess, that on the one hand, we have the diff- as you said, the difference between an awakened being and an unawakened being is the awakened person has confidence in their true nature. and the unawakened doesn't have that confidence. Mm-hmm. I like, I've never heard that quote. And I think that's beautiful. I was, I was touched by the simplicity of that and kind of the human, the human truth of it just from my own path and, and from my own work with people that this idea that it's kind of about confidence or, you know, we could, in another era, we might've called that faith. Mm-hmm. Right. And it could also have kind of, it could, trust could kind of come into that that a little bit too and constellate around it um and so you're kind of saying so let's take that as a truth and then say well how how, where would that come how would we develop that confidence Mm because clearly you know in the the purely direct path as you're saying the 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 idea would be it's the confidence is gained all at once it's gained through the radical realization you see it you know it and you never but see what would so let, let's just take one, one angle on this, one slice. So two people both have the same awakening. One, they both, one day they're in the same meditation retreat, opposite ends of the, of the room. And it just happens that they both just, wow, the whole thing all at once. Just this is it. It never wasn't it. Oh, this is who I've, this is how it's always been. How did I not see the truth of this? They're both you know, shaken to their core and just released into this happiness. And they're just, whoa, I, I see now that what, 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 if, that I've just been, I've just been denying something this whole time. I've just been rejecting who I am 
and I've been rejecting what the sacredness that this life is and that every moment is. I've just been holding it at bay. And I, for a moment through my practice and the way it was guided, I dropped it and I'm seeing it all and knowing it all right now. And they both have this. And the, the teacher says, yes, that's it. You, you're, I can tell you're seeing it and so are you and it's all happening. Now, one of them, and this would be the, the very rare student, right? The one in a million probably student never doubts it. They, they just, they, from that moment forward, they're just like free as a butterfly and they just like continue to exude this and they start telling everyone else about it. And pretty soon people are gathering around them for, because of what they're transmitting from through their being. Cause this has become so the, the truth of this has become so obvious to them that, and their confidence in it, uh, to use our term, is just unshaken and their life's changed forever. And that doesn't mean maybe that they still might have some work to do like on their uh, their shadow or this or that maybe, right? Because those might be some different lines of development, but we, we can save that for a, another time or for later at this time. But but so that's that person, that's their experience. The other student is pretty lit up for a few days very whoa something happened to me whoa you know and very trying and then they're and then but like a week later it's gone and it's like they remember something really incredible happened on that retreat they don't even quite remember what it was they know how it felt and maybe that's all they can remember now is how it felt it felt really free and amazing and expansive and so now when they sit down to meditate they try to get back to that feeling they felt because it's the only part the gross mind can remember is the feeling. So they're like, okay, oh yeah, I'm trying to, and now they're meditating. They're just trying to feel a certain way, which is not meditation and will never bear any fruit. Anyway, what is the difference between these two? Now, some people would say, well, this one was more ripe. Their karmas, their samskaras were more matured. They were, had done more preparation. They had prepared the vessel, all, you know, all kinds of ways we could look at it. But we could also just look at it and, and kind of really get interested in what, you know, this person just didn't doubt what they realized. And the other person, because of, you know, the momentum of their personality and their tendencies to doubt and to be insecure and fall into fear and the strength of their egos, you know, you know, structure and whatever else, they couldn't help but doubt it. And they just started almost immediately going, well, was that real? And I don't know. And, and you know, and they're trying to hold on desperately to the, the feeling and whatever. They, and pretty soon it's just they've, they've strangled it and it's gone or smothered it. Um, so, anyway, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kind of ru ruminating on what you're on this idea and kind of saying, well, we don't know, you know, exactly why one might be able to not doubt it and be confident in why the other might not. But how might we all proceed with the path if we could see that what's really needed is that we just need to accept some things about reality and have confidence in them. If we want to talk about spiritual awakening as that, we need to really have confidence that there's that's in some deep and fundamental things that our mind can't really know. And we have to have confidence that we can let go so deeply that a kind of spontaneous way of being will emerge and come forth from a place, an unpremeditated place where we never see it beforehand and live in kind of live in the unknown. And we're going to now start to live in the unknown all the time, live in not knowing, live in innocence and, and, and live in this trust, this faith, this confidence in something our mind can't see, but that we increasingly find to be the ground of our own being and this, this mystery. So, so from a path point of view, I, we can talk about a lot of parts of the path, but I want to talk a little bit about what I call the practice of direct awakening, because this is where I've tried to make a path out of the pathless, <laughs> you could say. And, and so, so what I mean by that is, is, when, when we're sitting in meditation doing the practice of direct awakening, what we're trying to do is we're, we're simply practicing, we're practicing being the way our awakened, our, our true nature, our Buddha nature, our awakened essence 
naturally already is. So we're trying to kind of practice being awake is maybe what I would say. So we're not practicing something in order to cause an awakening. We're practicing how does the mind function when we're awake? How does the heart function when we're awake? How do we relate to each moment when we're awake? And how could we turn that into a practice in our meditation and sit down and say, I'm going to meditate for 30 minutes now. And for this 30 minutes, I'm going to practice this way of being that is none other than an enlightened way of being. It's the way this, and, and it's exactly, I'm practicing exact being exactly the way I am when I'm my awakened self and the way anyone is when they're their awakened self. Cause just, just like the unawakened self is very predictable and, you know, the way we relate to opportunities, the, the way the ego relates to opportunity, the way the ego relates to challenge, the way we relate to fear, the way we relate to desire. That's pretty much the same for all of us. <laughs> Just it's the same with awakened consciousness to awaken human beings. It's very much the same mind. It's the same consciousness. And so let's take one example of, of a distinction between the, 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 we can see in someone who's awakened, you know, you're, I know you've got a lot of Buddhist training, Buddhist background, the whole concept of grasping and the grasping mind and the unenlightened mind tries to, it tries to hold on to everything. It's trying to find security. It's trying to find control in the world. And so we grasp and we grasp. And that means, you know, you sit in meditation and you're grasping onto thoughts you have a strong feeling, you're grasping onto the feeling, you keep attaching, let's say another would be attaching to everything, kind of attached to the feeling, we attach to the thought, we react then, because we're attached to it, we, re we react to it, that ultimately triggers our behavior, our unenlightened life flows from all that. So, so what if we sit in meditation, and our practice for the half hour is to not hold on to anything, to not grasp onto anything, to not attach to anything that arises. So we're just letting all experience occur and we're not exerting any preference for one experience over another. We have an uncomfortable feeling, we let it be. We have a, a wonderful feeling, we don't grab onto it. We, we, don't, we don't push it away, we don't grab on. We're just being. Now, that way of being is natural to an awakened human, awakened person. That's how they are because they're awakened and they've realized that there's nothing to hold on to anyway and that holding on just blocks this natural easeful flow from happening. And, and the, you know, part of awakening is we start to become, we fall in love with the unknown and we fall in love with a way of being that's mysterious to us and that, that kind of is leading us instead of us controlling it and leading it. So, we can practice that in our meditation immediately, right now. Anyone can. And th there's not a preparation for that. There's a, hey, sit down and try this way of relating to your thoughts, this way of relating to your feelings. Do this for half an hour. See what happens. And the, the miracle of it is that if we just do that and we really do it, we really will know our true nature in that moment because your ego can't let go <laughs> your ego can't you know let things be you know and so we're kind of short we're, we're creating a, we're creating an environment where it the 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 ego and i and by the ego i mean it in the kind of traditional eastern sense i guess as the kind of the primary obstacle to awakening the gra little grasping self um you know hungry to to feed itself always um yeah, so we're, we're creating an environment where awakened consciousness can naturally thrive and be because we're, we're kind of just practicing aligning with it, you could say. And so that's one, what I just described very simply is one of the practices of direct awakening. But we can see that awakened consciousness functions in a whole bunch of predictable ways that any of us who have had experience of awakening will go, yeah, right, that's true. Um, and then we can practice that 
And so these are the, that's why I say it's direct awakening because I, I don't mean that you only have to do it once for one second and now you're enlightened for the rest of your life. I mean that it's direct in the sense that we are directly practicing being awake when we're in meditation. There's no time in this. And that, and then so to bring it back to our point about confidence and, and so what happens is as we do these practices day after day where we're kind of just choosing to set aside a time to rest in and as awakened consciousness or our true nature and we're making that space and we are genuinely experiencing it more and more because we're really we're really making making room for it and it's really showing us really happening we develop more confidence in it you know we start to feel wow this is really a way i can be and what's it like to be this way off the meditation cushion and how do i let go in life and and this you know how do i make room for this beautiful mystery that's emerging out of the depths of my being and starting to show up how do i make room for it to to live my life and and not how to, and then we start to see all the ways we, so to come to the path so as now awakened consciousness is starting to lead us on the path because it's coming forth in our practice then what we find is we start to see everything we do all day long that gets in the way but we're not doing that because somebody told us it's in our experience we see oh there i go again i'm just I'm reacting out of fear or I'm trying to control the situation or I'm, you know, there's my doubt coming in and, you know, but it's all, we're seeing it because we're seeing it from somewhere else. We're now seeing it from the eyes of, of, of enlightenment, of, of awakening. And, and now the motivation to let go of those old habits and tendencies and all of the obstacles, which are many and profound. I'm not in any, I know some of the direct awakening people are kind of more like, there are no obstacles, just realize it and it's done and i'm not in that camp at all i'm, I'm like no there are a, a million obstacles and and you'll see them all as a way as you allow yourself to, to have more faith in in your own awakened self and then all of the obstacles you see and but then you have the motivation to relinquish them because you want to make more and more room for for the dharma to reveal itself in in your being and and you know so that's the kind of path that I guess I am very excited about and, and have found to be very potent for people who are – now, here's the only thing I want to say because you were asking like, well, if someone's maybe not really checked out spirituality, I mean, I guess I would say I hope that everything I've said about it might inspire you to want to check out spirituality um, and give more time to it. But, you know, it's – everything I'm talking about here takes a lot of maturity. It, it, to to uh, to relate to our life in this way, to have the discipline to practice in the way I'm describing, to take these radical positions of letting go completely or of not knowing anything. You know, that's another direct awakening to practice. Don't know anything for a while. Sit there for 30 minutes and don't try to know anything. Don't try to understand anything. Don't try to interpret your experience. Don't evaluate your experience. Don't label it. Don't judge it. Just... <laughs> don't know you know that's a very it requires a lot of austerity you know so these are these are very simple things they're very they're the most natural things they're also you know they take a lot of heart from us yeah absolutely <clears throat> so yeah you brought up a lot there and a couple of things i'd like to explore without i'm going to mm -hmm. try to avoid getting getting too uh far down the rabbit hole or too esoteric for our <laughs> uh, for our discussion here but um so you know yes we we really can't know where any individual is in terms of their karmic ripening or conditions or people if people do are open to the notion that we go through many lifetimes you know where where are we what's what's behind us what what trail are we bringing into the into the present moment experience and how that would affect things but it was really interesting you talked about those two students in the same retreat having the same experience and one kind of just really trusts that experience and develops immediate confidence in it and starts to live from that place and and maybe even begin to teach from that place uh and of course the, with the caveat that we don't we know many people who have done that and later on it it, it was proven that <laughs> right it, it they had some awful may have benefited a lot of people but clearly they still had work to do and, and ended up uh in some problems so right. um uh, but then the other person who just, you know, wow, I had an amazing experience, but, you know, immediately kind of begins to doubt it and, and so forth. So what's, so maybe what I think what you're talking about is how, 
regardless of where how we come into the situation, how might we practice that experience and and grad even gradually develop more confidence in it mm-hmm. by just practicing that experience? And the way you describe, uh, you know, the uh, I, it was a direct awakening practice or direct yeah. what was the word direct yeah practice of direct um, awakening yeah, yeah. The practice of direct awakening you know i mean it sounds to me like basically good solid meditation instruction even within shamatha vipassana tradition certainly within the formal traditions of mahamudra zochen or chikantaz and zen and uh many people have been doing practice with that good instruction in that way for for a long time and their life still goes through a tremendous amounts of ups and downs. And, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. But I'm wondering about in terms of, you know, maybe developing confidence in that. And uh, uh, I want to let me ask you something, Fleet, though. I just because I want to I just want us both to like mm-hmm. I'll I'll pretend I don't know anything about this. And you do the same. Let's just okay. for a moment, though, like so is it that. Is it that they've real like this person you said who's been doing that instruction for a long time rigorously, and their life is still kind of a mess in all these ways? Like, no, I didn't mean their life was a mess. Well, or, or, or you know, the ups. Oh, okay. But when you were saying the ups and downs, I thought you meant that they're still. No, not, what I really, what I, what I really uh, meant was they, um, you know, they haven't they haven't developed some confidence that this is it I'm there and stabilize it in their life mm-hmm. in such a way that they would start teaching it or, okay, you know, they're sure. still they're in the midst of their life. Okay. They have many problems here and they can, they can sit down and meditate and their mind can stabilize very quickly. And they can practice mm-hmm. in that way of, of, you know, with tremendous equanimity and letting things just be as they are and so forth. And, and yet, you know, that it, there's, you know, and this is described in great detail and, you know, in, in the meditation manuals of Zochen and Mahamudra, the layers and layers and layers of this, and also the possibilities of self-deception within that. And when you're right. in that very refined state of just not knowing, just letting things be as they are, one of the things that instruction is to look for is to look for the very subtle layers of fabrication, the very subtle That's layers right. of of grasping the very subtle layers of reification and so forth, or even the right. way experiences of... Yeah. So that, you know, um, maybe being able to accelerate this path of developing confidence in one's own experience such that it does begin to permeate one's life more. Because I, I can I can certainly feel and see that one can have those experiences. And part of the way, one of the reasons that they, even on a regular basis in one practice, and one of the reasons they don't permeate one's life more may be that one kind of doesn't have enough confidence yeah. That this is actually what we're all talking about, that this is actually what they're talking about in the books, right? right? That what right. I'm experiencing is, is actually that. And so in terms of accelerating the development of that context, I'm wondering about the uh, your your position on uh, or experience, really, on the importance of teachers. Because traditionally, in many traditions, uh, in the student-teacher relationship, and especially in the, you know, the more re- realization traditions, the teacher is able to sometimes facilitate an experience with a student, what's often called pointing out instructions, yeah. mm-hmm. where they have experience and the teacher goes, that's it. And, right. and of course, then a teacher, you know, the student, again, some students will walk away and that's really, you know, stabilizes something, accelerates their path, and they're able to practice with more confidence. And, and others will walk away going, what was, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, you know, he said I was there, but I, you know what I mean? <laughs> sure. So, but, I, I, my my basic question here is is what about teachers and what about uh you know the importance of of getting a glimpse of that uh in some form of transmission whether it's group or it's a particular teacher or the presence of a teacher so that accelerates one ability one's confidence that and one's faith that actually yes that is my nature I'm on the path to experiencing it and my practice is actually developing these qualities yeah i mean the whole question of of spiritual teachers has become so fraught and complex in mm-hmm. our time, right? It yes, used to it be has. it used to be straightforward back in yeah. back in the way old days, you know. Yeah. And it's getting deconstructed left and right to the point where I'm afraid we may be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, so. I, I, I'm with you. I mean, I'm I'm I kind of picked up from what you were saying. It sounds like you're. You're a little. You, your answer to that would be somewhere more on the side of teachers are incredibly important, and it's certainly been my experience that the deepest, you know, my deepest realizations and insights, it was in some way the affirmation of that. 
by a teacher or the pointing the way to it and then creating the context for it to flourish and, you know, the encouraging me to have the trust and the faith in it. You know, all of those things were very, very important. And if I look at, say, what's happening in my own relationship with people who take my courses and are in my ongoing community, you know, I, I hear back from them and I, and, and so often I'm, you know, I give a lot of instruction and people do a lot of practice on their own. And then I all, so often hear from people, well, but it's when I'm meditating with you and you're describing and you're pointing, cause I do, I do a lot of pointing out style, um, teaching. I don't, you know, teachers teach differently. I don't tend to sort of say, here is the meditation instruction, go sit. I, I like when I lead retreats, I'm, I'm in the meditation with the students and I'm speaking and I'm just, I'm pointing it out. I'm saying, now notice this Mm -hmm. and now notice that and do this and do that. And, you know, it's a kind of active pointing out thing. And, and I get so much feedback from students about the power of precisely that. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I've had some people come on my retreats and say, Oh my God, I've been, I've done, 50 you know <laughs> retreats in my life but i but because you were there holding guiding me through it the whole time i i went so much deeper than in my other 50 retreats because in those i was just given instructions and and left to sit on my own and and so i do think that the you know i, I i'm very again i don't know how many people could really find their way to any kind of meaningful spiritual awakening without having a teacher and and teachers, a teacher, but having that interaction. I don't know how many, I don't know. It seems to me a very, you know, a very rare seeker who had just so much drive for it and so much, you know, aptitude and, and ability to hear it that maybe they could just read the books and kind of receive the Dharma then the transmission that's in the written words, because it's there. The transmission's in the, the written words. If they're written by an awakened teacher or, you know, spoken by an awakened teacher, it's there. You know, maybe they could receive it and just be self-guided and have enough discernment and discipline and structured enough way of relating to things that they could really find their way. Maybe a very rare, but like, again, maybe that's one in... One in 10,000, you know, practitioners. Right. Yeah, I don't know. One in 100,000. It's a very rare thing. Who knows, so I, what, who knows what lays behind there that yeah. moment. So, yeah, so I, I like to broaden broaden out for a moment. I mean, suffice it to say, you know, because we're, we're talking here on in the Summit of Spiritual and Con, and it's really, we need to, I mean, you and I come from contemplative traditions. We have a lot of shared experience, and we're talking about meditation, and we're talking about, you know, direct awakening practices and non-dual practices and so forth. And uh, and yet, really, this this subject includes all the faith based and devotional practices, and all the ways in which people approach spirituality and shamanic paths, and mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. And uh, so, suffice it to say, um, I personally feel, and I, I think you would agree, that if one really gets interested in deepening this part of our lives. It's really helpful to get good, clear guidance and good, clear instruction. And we know more about that than we ever have in life, both mm-hmm. with the availability of all the ancient teachings, which have all been published, and also sure. the modern scientific interaction with that. And it's not hard to find people like yourself and others who brought a modern Western scientific uh, perspective mm-hmm. to really getting to the essence of these ancient traditions, teachings across many traditions. And so, you know, it, the the pathway, if we're willing to do a little research, do our homework, uh, I think the pathway is more accessible than ever into really good quality instruction and teaching that could help us deepen our practice, whatever the means of that practice is, uh, rather than kind of floundering around for a long time. But it does Absolutely. require it does require doing our homework because there's also a lot of you know, just stuff out there. So um, <laughs> there is a lot of stuff out there now. <laughs> there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff out there. But I want to broaden, it, you know, into okay, what are we talking about with awakening? Well, in the early Chan teachings, there was a wonderful book. I, I don't think I'll be remember the, the name right now. It's been a long time, but it's a Western scholar that really studied the early Chan teachings in China, which is the precursor to Zen Buddhism, mm-hmm. and um, made the case that what those teachings were saying and really demonstrating was that the only place we can really identify something called awakening or enlightenment is in the relational field. 
Like that's the only place we can point to that's really showing yeah. up, right? That's you know, right. this is somewhat in uh, terms of Mahayana view that the, uh-huh. the, that kind of myth of personal realization. Now, somebody can say they're personally awakened, and uh, maybe that's their subjective experience, but how does it actually show up in the relational field? And I think we're all deeply concerned about the overall global relational (laughs) field at this time on the planet. You know, are things evolving in a positive way? Are we devolving? What's going on? And even in our personal lives, I think when most of us think about deepening ourselves spiritually, you know, some of us may long to have powerful transcendent experiences, but I also think we're just talking about deepening our lives and wanting to have better relationships and a more fulfilling life and, you know, maybe feel more connected to nature and more connected to others and these kind of things. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about that aspect of it, of of the how, you know, this connection to the idea of awakening being a phenomenon of, of the relational field and a phenomenon of the collective. Uh, it's wonderful to hear that that um, it was an early Chan idea. I, I didn't know that. And it's definitely been my experience. I mean, when, when people ask me, how do you know if you're awake? And I say other people will tell you, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I mean, jo- half jokingly, but have not because the, you know, we, again, it, we can only find it in our relationships with others and how we live. Um, that's where all of, that's where all of our triggers will come out and reveal the ways that we're not yet aligned with that. And it's, it's also where, it's where the beauty of all this starts to manifest and show up is, is in, you know, the, so what are the, I guess maybe we could say, what are the relational measures of awakening that you can start to notice? And you would say things like radical vulnerability, like a willingness and, and vulnerability. So when you think of vulnerability as maybe a willingness or, you know, you can be harmed or something. So you're vulnerable to, to harm. But vulnerable to be moved, vulnerable to be influenced by others. You know, one of the one of the ways I always am, am really, I, where I always notice that awakening shows up in people, and where you really start to see it is when, say, somebody really is so is more interested in what they can learn from the relational field, meaning others, and how it can influence them than they are in what they already know and their, their trajectory. When you meet someone who's like meeting people and they're kind of like, wow, what, you know, what do you know? And what, what, how do you relate to life? And how I might, you know, model off that someone who's really willing to flow and be moved and be influenced. That's a, a lot of vulnerability. And also someone who's willing to be very transparent and not have anything to hide and not have anything to, that they're ashamed of or don't, wouldn't want to be seen. So that's again a relational measure of awakening, a kind of transparency of self, a vulnerability. Um, I think, you know, uh, the obvious things like care and compassion that show up in relationship and, and, you know, a genuine love, loving orientation to people that's, that's not related to, it's not more so for the people that you know better. It's, it, it might express itself more in those relationships because they're closer, but that, that kind of fundamental care and concern that, that shows up equally kind of for any human being because we are knowing so deeply that we are all this one self and, and we just can't help but feel so, so much tenderness for everyone around us. So, I mean, those are all very relational measures. And they're, again, when you start seeing those things happening, again, you're, your more conscious friends will definitely tell you, they'll say, well, what's happening for you? You know, you're like shining and you're present and you're available and your care is here and you're totally, you're, oh, here's another one, a lack of self-preoccupation. You're, you're here in this conversation and you're completely here. There's your, I can tell your attention is not somewhere. You're not, not thinking about the other thing. You're not worrying about yourself. You're not concerned about how you look or what, what you just said or whether people like to eat. It's, there's no self-consciousness that makes you this incredibly open relational being. And, you know, so the, all of these things, I, I just, I'm loving your, your Chan, you know, quote. And just, I think it's so deeply true because otherwise, you know, like you said, it, maybe there's such a thing as subjective awakening. I mean, certainly there is, you know, we, we have experiences of being more awake and then we have experiences of being less awake. And those can be very internal. Like can be on a meditation retreat where you go through heaven and you go through hell and then hopefully it ends in heaven, <laughs> but, but you know, maybe not, but you know, there is a subjective world of awakening, but it doesn't matter much. 
the one that matters is the one that's you know impacting the world through through our our engagement and interaction so that's a absolutely a really lovely yeah lovely way to look at it and it brings us together it brings us out because you know I, I will say a lot of people on the spiritual path i mean you know do kind of somewhat keep it a bit to themselves i think maybe because they have family members who aren't that you know, a lot of us have family members who don't really get our spirituality and why we're so passionate about it. They don't share it. You know, they're not as interested in it. So we kind of take it off and we have our little solitary practice. And hopefully we have some kind of sangha, some spiritual friendships where we get to share that. But, uh, you know, ideally this just lives fully in the world and, and it just inspires everyone else who's not spiritual to kind of go, you know, is it maybe you're on to something? Maybe I should check this out after all, because you sure seem, you know, you seem to be radiating something that I want some of that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, Craig, thank you very much for this really rich conversation. You know, there's an idea I maybe I want to close on that from uh, that I've read in your work that you talk about sort of re-engineering, you know, and using the modern approach of re-engineering uh, the awakened state or awakenment, right? You know, mm -hmm. re-engineering like companies do that with other companies. Reverse engineering. Products, go buy, reverse engineering, I'm sorry. Reverse engineering, reverse yeah, engineering yeah, I, I know what you meant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A company will go get a, some other company's product and they'll take it apart. They'll get engineers, take it apart, and they'll figure out how they made it and they'll, they'll, they'll make it themselves, right? Reverse yeah. engineering. So reverse engineering, you know, awakening. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that could be really broadly applicable. You know, we're all we've all been inspired uh, by various spiritual and religious fig religious figures in our life or even people that maybe wouldn't put in those boxes. But human beings who really inspired us because of their lives. And uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, so rather than just being inspired by them, we could actually begin to really emulate that in some way and look, OK, who were they really and, and what were they manifesting and and yes. how that and you know I, I there there was a religious movement at one point i'm not sure if it's still around anymore but it basically was based on a simple principle of continually asking one's self this question in the midst of one's life as one faced decisions and challenges in life what would jesus do oh yeah right and and the idea was actually really trying to not just emulate you know and be devoted to jesus as this way off distant enlightened or or god person but really try to live that way the, the example that he gave in his life and really begin to live that way so i think whoever we're inspired by and and the books we've read and whether it's you know on the similar meditation paths like craig and i've been referencing or more faith-based or devotional paths um we could actually think about reverse engineering that and trusting that as human beings we all have the same capacity we all have this innate goodness we all have this unconditional innate wisdom, goodness, and wholeness. And, you know, if we're willing to kind of take the leap, we can actually start practicing that in the way you're talking about. It. And I think that could be really broadly applicable to whatever anyone's particular, um, you know, context or, or, mm -hmm. or focus or interest is in, in spirituality and consciousness. So I, I'm I really with you. I love that. I, 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 I mean, any... I love it as a contemplation. Just anyone who you inspires you realize that you can, what, what is it about? How do, how would I do that? How would I be that way? What would have to change? How, how would I have to relate to this moment to show up that way? And we can find it because yeah, we're example, all the same. We're all the same person really yeah. fundamentally. So we can find one our example way. example for that. me was, uh, mm -hmm. I, I was always very inspired as many people have been by Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And before many people know my backstory, I spent 14 years in prison and uh, as a practitioner, which is kind of by how I ended up in prison. It's a long story. But at any rate, it was my monastery time. And uh, so I, I was shortly before getting out, I read his book again. I said, I got to read that book again. And which he, you know, covers his whole journey of I think 26 years in prison and then getting out of prison. And and, uh, you know, I really took that that view of how how can i you know it's amazing how did he come out of 26 years in prison and onto the world stage as this incredible states person that brought healing uh and unity to his country and overcame apartheid and you know how how did he do that people don't come out of prison that way right how did he do that mm -hmm. and so i really focused on you know wanting to emulate and be that and crack the code of what he was doing right 
uh, in order to try to bring my best out into the world as I came Beautiful. out of prison, right? So I, I think we can really look at that in almost any area of life and certainly in the realm of spirituality and consciousness. And and just, I think one of the things can can really spark us is having that basic faith that um, we all are unconditionally uh, good, enlightened, wise, and, and the work is really just uncovering the obstacles to that. So I think uh, I really appreciate that you've been pointing us in that direction so directly today and, and really appreciate this conversation. Me too, Fleet. Thanks so much for having me and uh, really been a delight i feel like we could feel like we could go on for another three hours and we could not get bored <laughs> so thanks so much i hope it's uh yeah i hope that um some of this uh sticks or provides a pointer and and helps uh some of you who are tuning in on your own path if you i know you invited me to to share a link so if any of you want to um explore this a little bit more i i've got a free ebook that you can go download called unlocking the power of meditation it kind of uh similar to some of what we've been doing here but it sort of looks at some of the most common kind of mistakes we make in our meditation that take us away from the simplicity mm -hmm. that i was talking about here and i have a link craighamiltonglobal.com forward slash best year so Great. craighamiltonglobal.com forward slash best year there Wonderful. it is so thanks again. Have Thank a wonderful you, Craig. Day. Well. Take care.